This evening we're going to continue looking through Psalm 119, and we'll, we'll do so as long as, it's, as long as it's fruitful, as long as it's edifying. Uh, thankfully, the psalmist gives us variety here, and he doesn't deal with the same subject every time. Now, there is a, uh, a common theme that's woven through Psalm 119, and that is the psalmist's high regard for the law of God for the, uh, the commandments of God because he realizes that it is the path that leads to a variety of things. And uh, what we want to see uh, this evening, of course, is that it, it does lead to persecution. However, uh, we want to see that, um, uh, that it's worth it because it also uh, leads us to the one who is worthy uh, to sacrifice ourselves for, and that is God, of course, and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me uh, read for you the section we're going to be dealing with this evening uh, from verses 17 through verse 24. The psalmist uh, writes, deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. I am a stranger in the earth. Do not hide your commandments from me. My soul is crushed with longing after your ordinances at all times. You rebuke the arrogant, the cursed, who wander from your commandments. Take away reproach and contempt for me, for I observe your testimonies. Even though princes sit and talk against me, your servant meditates on your statutes. Your testimonies also are my delight. They are my counselors. May the Lord bless His Word to our uh, understanding this evening and use it to encourage us to walk in the Lord's ways. Now, I want just to remind you briefly that so far we've seen that living according to the commandments is not only living according to love, it's not only the way that uh, by doing so we love the Father and we love the Son, the Holy Spirit, we love God, and it's not only the way that we love our neighbors, we love ourselves, though it is the standard that teaches us how to do that. But we see that there's also blessings that can come from obeying the Lord. The first blessing was the, the blessing really of blessing. Uh, if we walk in the ways of the Lord, it does bring blessing. And uh, it certainly brings spiritual blessing. It brings a, you know, emotional wholeness. It, it brings a heart filled with God's Holy Spirit because we don't grieve and quench the Spirit of God. It may even bring, I, I believe it does according to Scripture, uh, physical blessings. The Lord promises that He will meet all of our needs and even do abundantly beyond all we ask or think if we obey Him, trust Him, and seek Him. But we've also seen last week that it's the way that we can realize the, the purity of heart and mind that the Lord desires us to have as we set our eyes on the prospect of being with our Lord forever in heaven. Remember, John reminds us that whoever has this hope fixed on, on the Lord, the fact that we will be like Him when we see Him, purifies Himself just as He is pure. And the commandments show us how we might do that. I was actually very encouraged by that message last week. So I've been seeking more to try to uh, do what the Lord calls me to do in this regard, and, and I have found what the Lord says is true. Certainly, if we walk in His ways, it does create a greater purity and a greater closeness with the Lord, which is what I hope as Christians we're seeking after. Now, this evening, I do want us to see what the psalmist also warns us of. If we're going to walk in these commandments to receive this blessing and to live a pure life, if we're going to love the way God calls us to love, there is going to be a price that we're going to have to be willing to pay. And that price, of course, is persecution. If our desire to be with the Lord is strong enough to move us to walk in His ways and to do His will, we do need to understand that it will draw attention, and it won't always be good attention as far as um, what people intend who see us. There will be people who hate us. They will hate us because they hated Jesus Christ. And, of course, we have to be willing to pay for that. Now, let's look at what the psalmist here is actually asking. Uh, he not only makes statements, he also makes petitions to the Lord. And he begins this section by asking this from 
his God. He says, deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Now, what is the psalmist actually asking for here? Well, he prays, first of all, that the Lord would deal bountifully with him, that the Lord would be gracious to him and abundantly so. In other words, the psalmist here was seeking uh, abundant life, the abundant living, life to the full. You know, we hear a lot about abundant living today. There's even whole movements, whole churches that are founded on this principle. But what did the psalmist mean by this? Did he mean the same things that those who preach abundant life mean? that God would give to us uh, more of the things of the world so that our life would be more comfortable and we would live as children of the King with all the possessions we might possibly want, with perfect health, with strength, with fame, honor, and glory? Well, actually, no, that's not what he meant. Abundant living can really entail just the opposite of those things. He actually makes two requests of the Lord here. The dealing bountifully with him has in mind two things, that he says that I may live and that I may keep your words. That is how the psalmist wanted God to deal bountifully with him. Now, by living, he either meant to really live by living a holy life. In other words, that kind of what we call abundant living that comes from knowing that you're in God's will, walking in the fullness of the Spirit with that joy and peace comes from walking with the Lord, or he may simply mean, let me live and not die because I've drawn persecution to myself for walking according to the commandments. And I really think that he has that more in mind, but he doesn't exclude the first. He wanted to live and he wanted to keep God's Word. Actually, he only wanted to live if by so doing, he wouldn't have to compromise but might honor God by his life. Remember the Apostle Paul said something similar where he was struggling with the desire to depart and be with Christ, which would be very much better than remaining on in the world. But if he were to remain on in the world, it would only be that he might have fruit, that he might do God's will, that he might glorify Him. So he was content to go either direction, but he preferred to be with the Lord. Well, the psalmist wanted to live but he wanted to live only if he could live a life that didn't compromise, but rather gave glory to the Lord. The psalmist, in other words, had his priorities straight, the kind of priorities that we ought to have. I mean, what is the use of living if we can't obey the Lord? Abundant life, the real, you know, what what is really living is walking with God. And in the rest of this section... His prayer really addresses both of these concerns, that he might live and that he might obey the Lord. Now, since the Lord has given us this in his word, and he has given this for our example, this is what we ought to be seeking after as well. So what is it that he looks for more specifically as he seeks the Lord for this particular blessing? Well, he says in verse 18, open my eyes, first of all, that I may behold wonderful things from your law. Now, if you are going to live and if you are going to uh, know God's will and be able to walk with Him, how can you do that unless you know what it is? He prays that His eyes may be opened to understand what it is that God wants, but I believe more than that, that He might want to do what God wants. He prays, open my eyes. And in what way is he praying that God would open his eyes? Well, there's no reason to think that he was blind, that he couldn't read, or that he was deaf and he couldn't hear. Perhaps he was asking that God would open the eyes of his reason so that he might better understand. Perhaps that through more thorough study, he might better understand who God is and what God wants and how he might take his truth and apply it to his life so that he might do it. Maybe he was looking for more than just understanding. Maybe he wanted to see wonderful things from the law of God because he wanted to make a new discovery. Sadly, uh, sometimes as Christians, and especially intellectual Christians, or at least, you know, Christians who believe they know a great deal about the Word of God, they're always looking for something new in the Bible uh, so they can make their mark in the intellectual world 
to be remembered for some great insight. Uh, some people spend their whole lives seeking after those things. But I don't really think the psalmist had really that in mind, and I don't think he had merely the idea of seeking to understand God's Word better, but I think what he wanted to see was what it is that all Christians want to see in the Word of God, and that is God's glory. Now, if there's anything the example of Moses taught us when, uh, when he made his own petition to the Lord and asked uh, to see His glory, it's, it's exactly that. That's what every Christian desires. Moses couldn't wait to get to heaven to see the glory of God. He wanted to see it right then. He wanted, in other words, a preview of the beatific vision. Again, something you, you perhaps heard me refer to in the past, something that we don't often think about, but something that Every believer desires, and of course, um, sometimes when it's pointed out and we see it more clearly, it helps us to go that direction perhaps more strongly. The beatific vision, the desire to see God. Now, why would anybody want to see God when you think about it? Well, certainly the unbeliever has no interest in seeing Him because he knows to see Him would be to be destroyed, but that's not true of the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. The believer wants to see God because God is beautiful. And I, you know, ask yourself the question, do you enjoy beauty? I, th I think the Lord has made us to enjoy those things. I mean, we enjoy listening to beautiful sounds, uh, music. You know, we don't like dissonance and, and chaos. We like beautiful melodies and harmonies. We like beautiful sounds. We, we love tasting delicious foods, sort of something beautiful to our taste buds, you might say. We enjoy smelling fragrant aromas. We also like looking at beautiful things, at least things that we can look at that God has given to us to look at that are beautiful, the beauty of, of a face or of a lush forest or, or you know, grand mountains, a fiery sunset or maybe even a starry sky. Now, if looking at these things and, and really all these things that sort of stimulate the senses in this way, if these things bring pleasure to us, then how much more would that which is infinitely more beautiful than all of these things put together, how much more will that bring pleasure to our souls? It's really impossible to understand the, the beatific vision the beauty of God, and I think even when we see it, we're, it's going to be you know, like, like looking at the Grand Canyon, only infinitely more so. You just can't take it all in. Or when you stand and look at Half Dome or, or uh, Capitan and so forth, and, and you just see how, how big it is. You, you know, you're, just, you're trying to take it in, but you really can't. Well, God's going to be infinitely more than that. But you see, we do know something of that glory. We have had a sight of that glory by the Holy Spirit. And that has given us a desire for more of that beauty. What the psalmist, I believe, is praying for is illumination. The work of the Holy Spirit to show us the glory of God in the Word. Because God's glory consists mainly of His holiness. And the law of God expresses that holiness. The psalmist wants to see it. And that's what you and I should desire as well. That God would open our eyes to see the beauty of God in His Word, who He is, but more specifically, what God actually is like, that you would know what it is that really pleases Him and that you could live that way and walk on the road of fellowship with Him. I believe that's what the psalmist is asking for when he says, open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. Now, he goes on to say in verse 19, I am a stranger in the earth. Do not hide your commandments from me. What is it that you should experience if the Lord actually answers this prayer and opens your eyes so that you can see His glory, so that you can see wonderful things in His law? Well, once you see this beauty that only the Spirit of God can reveal to you, it changes the disposition of your heart so that the world is no longer a satisfying thing to you. 
Now you want something that is greater. Now you want something more. Now you want God. Uh, more of even the best things that the world has to offer will not satisfy you after you see the glory of God. I mean, the Lord puts in this world many things that are precious, many things that we love, fathers and mothers, husbands and wives, children, even things, again, that the Lord gives us as possessions. But there is nothing that can compare to Him once we see Him, which is why our Lord reminded His disciples on one occasion that we must love Him so much more that it is actually like we hate those who are closest to us. Once you see God, you want God. You hunger and thirst after Him. Nothing else is going to satisfy you but Him. And so the world no longer has the appeal that it had before. And you begin to confess with the psalmist, I am a stranger in the earth. This isn't my home. This isn't my final destination. This isn't my possession. I really don't even care about it. I'm just passing through to my real destination, which is heaven. The author to the Hebrews, it's interesting how these things in the New Testament are echoed in the Old Testament, but it shouldn't surprise us with one author. And really the standard and the goal has always been the same. The author to the Hebrews is going to tell us that this is what faith produces in our lives. If you have faith, you will find this to be true. He, after giving sort of a, you know, a catalog of some of the Old Testament saints, he, he pauses to say this, all of these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. If the Lord has opened your eyes, this is what you want. Uh, not just because the alternative happens to be hell, you don't want to go to heaven just because you don't want to go to hell, but you want to go to heaven because God is there, because the one who is infinitely beautiful is there, and you want to see His beauty. The Puritans, uh, I believe, said rightly or correctly that those who love God would rather be in hell if that's where God was, and He is there in a certain sense, but not in the sense they mean rather than in heaven if God were not there, because God is what makes heaven heaven. They want to be with God wherever God is. Thankfully, God has uh, decided to be in a place where it's a blessing for those who are with Him. But again, God is the goal, not the pleasure of being in heaven. It is the pleasure of seeing Him and being with Him. If you love God, that's where you want to be. But again, what is the path that leads to heaven? that will actually allow us to see the beatific vision. Well, there's really only one, and that is the highway of holiness, the way of obedience. And so the psalmist prays, do not hide your commandments from me. Show me the path that leads to you. Well, why would God ever hide them? Well, He doesn't actually. But sometimes He may obscure them because He's disciplining us or perhaps we love the world too much and maybe our sins are keeping us from seeing the way or maybe seeing the glory of that way, the beauty of that way so that we're not walking on it as we should. So we do need to pray that the Lord would show them to us, show us the glory of it, show us the beauty of it, show us the way of it, especially if it happens to be hidden from us now, that the Lord would open our eyes to see it so that we can walk on this path. Now, how much should you desire to know His way that you might walk on this path? Well, if you see the value of the goal, which again is the beatific vision, if you understand even a little of what it means, because of course God has given you a glimpse of it, then you should want it more than anything else. And so you should desire the path that leads you to it more than anything else. The psalmist says, my soul is crushed 
with longing after your ordinances. Now think about that for just a moment because if there is anything in, in Christendom that is perhaps more under attack or if there's, you know, there's probably nothing more under attack than God's law, and a statement like this really can't be understood by a number of Christians today because they think the law somehow is something bad rather than something good. The psalmist says, my soul is crushed with longing after these. I, I desire them so much. It feels like the desire is just crushing me, the weight of it. Antinomians really can't understand. Those are the people who really are opposed to the law of God, think it's a bad thing. They really can't understand how anyone could desire the law of God like this. I mean, after all, it requires more than anybody could possibly do, especially after the fall. The law can only condemn you. It can't give you life. They think that the apostle Peter actually called it a burden which neither they nor their forefathers could bear. Now, if you had to keep the law to justify yourself, then you might look at it this way, the way the antinomians do. But you don't look at it that way. You shouldn't look at it that way because you realize that it wasn't given to you in order to save you. Jesus kept it so that you could enter into heaven. But rather than being a means by which you save yourself, if you look at it for what it really is, the way you show God gratitude, the way you become more like Jesus Christ, the way you can love God and, and love your neighbor, uh, the, the path by which to follow Him, the way to please Him and to be like Him, then you love it because you know that it is the path that leads to Him. By the way, the psalmist also goes on to talk about how often he felt this way towards the commandments of God. Uh, he didn't feel a crushing weight of Him, you know, pushing Him down into hell, but he was crushing, uh, the crushing of his soul was the desire to know them, and that, he said, was something he experienced all the time. My soul is crushed with longing after your ordinances at all times. So if you see what God really is like, and if you really desire to be with Him and you know this is the path that leads to Him, then you will desire to walk in this path all the time. That will be what you want more than anything else, to serve Him. And that your service would not be just temporarily here and there, not just with starts and fits, not only when it suits you, not only when it's convenient, but you will seek to serve Him at all times, even as the Apostle Paul once said regarding his own ministry toward the Lord, how the love of Christ constrains him. Constrains him to do what? To lay himself out for the gospel, to spend and be spent to suffer whatever he has to suffer, whatever persecution that would come his way. And read 2 Corinthians for a catalog of the many things he had to endure in order to do this. Why was he willing to go through this? Why was he willing to suffer so much for this? Well, again, it's because the love of Christ constrained him. He loved the Lord so much, he couldn't do anything other than what the Lord wanted him to do because in so doing that, he experienced again more of God's presence. He saw more of his glory. And in doing so, he was on the path that led to heaven, to the beatific vision. Now, is there anything else that the psalmist says that should motivate you? Well, there is actually fear. The psalmist was also fully aware of what God does to those who conveniently set his commandments aside when they don't suit them. He says, you rebuke the arrogant, the cursed who wander from your commandments. That's something the psalmist didn't want. He wanted to see the beatific vision. He didn't want to get off the path, and he realized, too, how God deals with those who step off. Now, do notice here how disobedience is characterized by the Lord because this is what you must be in order to set aside God's commandments and walk on some other path. It's arrogance. It's really the height of arrogance to put what you want above what God commands. I do want you to remember that James and Peter both point out that God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. And God resists the proud for good reason, because the psalmist says that those who wander from the commandments are arrogant and 
they are cursed. They come into this world under the curse of the broken covenant of works with Adam, and they will leave this world cursed unless they submit to God. You must submit to the Lord if you are going to see heaven. Otherwise, you remain under the curse. And of course, God in the gospel gives you the means by which you may submit to Him, that you may trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and be given that heart that desires to walk in these commandments for the reasons already given. So the warning here is don't fall into that category and end up being rebuked by the Lord. Let the fear of the Lord move you. If the love of the Lord isn't strong enough, let the fear of the Lord be strong enough to move you to trust in His Son and to walk on the highway of holiness that leads to heaven. Again, I mentioned before, those are the two main motivations God gives us in His Word, the fear of the Lord and the love of the Lord, one of them drawing you forward, the other one pushing you from behind to make sure that you go forward. Now, what will these cursed do to you if you walk with the Lord? Well, here's where persecution comes. They will hate you. The psalmist prays in verse 22, take away reproach and contempt from me, for I observe your testimonies. Where is this reproach and contempt coming from? It's coming from those who don't obey God. There, there are those who say, as we've already mentioned before, the Abundant Living group, that if you obey God and God blesses you, and basically you'll have no more troubles, you'll have no more worries, everything will be smooth sailing from here on out. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. As a matter of fact, the Bible teaches it's going to be just the opposite. Jesus said, if the world hated Him, it will also hate you. Paul says, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, as we saw in our meditation. And just think about this for a minute. I mean, consider that virtually everything that people want to believe, that they want to hold to, every custom that they might have from their particular culture, every belief that they might have from their particular religion, sadly, just about every perversion that people want to embrace is tolerated and accepted in the world. There's only one thing that is not tolerated, and that is Christianity. It's the only one because it is the only one of divine origin. It's the only one that expresses the holiness of God. It's the only one that reveals what the world hates. And it's the only one that Satan hates, which is the reason why he fights against that one, but not against the others. If you follow Christ and really follow Him, if you live like the Lord Jesus Christ, if you speak like Him, if you act like Him, the world will hate you. If they don't hate you openly, they will certainly hate you secretly. So again, don't expect to be popular in the world's eyes if you are going to follow Jesus. But again, I would say don't worry about that because what you gain is far more than anything you lose. Now, Jesus said that this is what it was going to be like to His followers, which is why He also said you must be willing or you have to, be, you have to count the cost before you begin to follow Him. And having counted it and realizing what it's going to cost you, you have to be willing to pay that price. Or if you begin, you might not be able to finish. And then you will become an even larger laughingstock in the world's eyes. You know, they jump on every opportunity they can to persecute us, to blame us, to accuse us, to reproach us. And that would be just one more reason to do so. So you have to be willing to pay the price, and you have to be willing to pay it to the end. Now, how much hatred and persecution must you be willing to bear in order to follow the Lord? Well, you have to be willing to bear whatever it's going to cost you to follow Him, even if it means those highest in authority persecute you. Psalmist says in verse 23, even though princes sit and talk against me, your servant meditates on your statutes. So many today who name the name of Christ are willing to compromise with Him. They are willing to give Him up even for the sake of their friends, if their friends turn on them. But what would they do if the princes of the lands, if the mayor, the governor, senator, 
president spoke against them and conspired against them for their downfall. What would you do if that were the case with you? Well, again, Jesus said you have to be willing to pick up your cross to follow after Him. You have to make that decision that your life in this world is, is essentially over and that you are dead, even as I had prayed just a few moments ago. You must be willing to die for Christ. You have to be willing to give your life for this cause if you're not willing to do that. If you're not willing to pay the ultimate price, you're not going to be able to do what Jesus actually calls you to do. And so lastly, where are you going to find the strength in order to pay this price? You're only going to find it if you love the Lord. Only if God and His Son and His kingdom and His ways are precious to you. Verse 24, your testimonies also are my delight. They are my counselors. Again, he's crushed with longing after these things. There's only one thing that is worth paying that ultimate price, and that is God. You have to desire God. You have to desire to be with Him. That's the only way you're going to be willing to take the road that leads to Him. That's exactly what motivated Jesus Christ. He says, in, well, actually, this, the author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 12, verses 2 and 3, that Jesus, for the joy set before Him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider Him who has endured such hostility by sinners against Himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Grow weary and lose heart, why? Well, because you also are enduring, having to endure hostility by sinners against you. Consider that Jesus also did, but He was willing to do that because of the joy that was set before Him, that joy of honoring His Father, that joy of being with His Father, that joy of the glory that would be His. This is what motivated Paul as well. He says, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself up for me. As Paul thinks about the great love of Christ for him, it moves him to count himself as dead with Christ, crucified with Christ. I don't live anymore. It's not that Paul wasn't alive, but he no longer lives for himself and for his own will. Now he lives for Christ. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself up for me. And then he goes on to say later in Galatians, but may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. How can Paul be willing to give up what he gives up in his service of Christ? It's only because his love for the Lord is stronger. He is willing to die for Him and so the world is dead to him, and he is dead to the world. How could Stephen have been willing to testify of Christ, even to the point of being stoned to death, if he hadn't already died with the Lord Jesus Christ because of his love for him and his desire to be with him? You have to love the Lord this much. Otherwise, you're not going to find the strength to be able to give your life the way He calls us to. You're not going to be willing to suffer persecution. You're going to avoid it at every turn, and to do that, you have to compromise. You have to step off the path that leads to God. But every time we step off, as we saw in Pilgrim's Progress, we run into danger. When we get off the road, we're no longer safe. But now we expose ourselves to the enemy's attacks. We expose ourselves to God's discipline, and thankfully God is willing to do that. We must be willing to walk on that path no matter what the cost. And then the psalmist ends by basically telling us when he says that your testimonies are my counselors, he's reminding us that you must not allow yourself to listen to what anyone else says. Don't listen to the wisdom of your own flesh. Don't listen to the wisdom of this world. Don't listen to your friends who tell you otherwise. Listen to God and listen to Him alone. If you really want to see God, 
You have to delight in Him, but you have to do more than just delight in Him. You need to walk in the ways of His commandments. You have to be willing to do them, even if it means persecution and death. And you're not going to be willing to do that unless you're willing to die, unless you've already died in Christ. If you don't have that level of commitment, the Lord basically tells you you're not going to make it. It doesn't mean that you're going to have to give your life up. Maybe you will, maybe you won't as far as actually die for Christ. But you must be willing to do that. He must be that precious to you. And if He isn't that precious, then pray and ask the Lord to give that, uh, that sight of Him to you so that He will be precious enough to pay this price so that you will be able to discover what abundant life really is, which is to live, to keep the commandments of God. May the Lord grant again to each of us that grace to be able to do that. Well, let's bow for a few moments of prayer and, and let's ask that the Lord would give us that grace. Help us to love Him enough to give up everything to follow Him.